Radio. This podcast is called Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest get some secrets off their chest. You should listen. It's the best. Hello and welcome to Obsessed with Joseph Scrimshaw on Feral Audio. I am your host. I am still Joseph Scrimshaw. This week's episode is about something we all love, binge watching, and something we all have absolutely no possibility of avoiding, politics. If you take binge watching, politics, and our guest, comedian and writer TJ Chambers, in a martini shaker and make a nice little cocktail, you'll get the subject of this week's episode, the TV show The West Wing. As always, you also hear our co-producer Sarah Meyer interviewing random human beings around Los Angeles and seeing how they feel about the West Wing. Do they love it? Do they hate it? Have they watched it? Did they watch it week to week? Or did they binge watch all of the West Wing on Netflix in one sitting until their couches groaned in pain and the nerve endings in their buttocks screamed in existential dread then shrugged and gave up? We will find out. But before we dive deep into TJ's fascinatingly healthy obsession with a well-made and respected TV show, I'd like to share another political obsession from our past. Our co-producer, Sarah Meyer, who you'll remember from the other thing I just said, has been obsessively digging up articles with the word obsession in them. We found one that's strangely appropriate for this politically charged episode. The article is from the May 3rd, 1913 edition of the Washington Post and is entitled... Arrested at White House. Caller wanted Wilson to keep scientists from getting his brains. Now, at this point, you might assume, oh, this guy didn't want his brain to go to science after he died. But no, that is incorrect. He did not want his brain to go to dumb people right now. The article reads, A man with the most unusual obsession so far discovered among the cranks who have been deterred from visiting President Wilson was stopped yesterday afternoon. Now, I love the picture that this paints. Did the White House just have a line set up for so-called cranks? And not like a phone line, like a place you could line up to say crazy things. Was the line subdivided into different obsessions? Who knows? History books, probably, but I don't have any in front of me right now, so I get to make wild, irresponsible guesses and say, yes, there was a literal crank line, and this guy was in the obsessed with brains part of the line, not the my daughter rode a tandem bike with Satan and now she's pregnant with the Antichrist line, or the hobos ate my baby line, or God knows how many lines there were. The article continues. The prisoner said he was Arthur A. Marchant, 38 years old, a laborer of Harwich, Massachusetts. He told Sergeant McQuaid, and Sergeant McQuaid is a real name, not a no-nonsense cop seven days from retirement in a movie from 1987. No, he told Sergeant McQuaid that he had read a good deal about Jimmy Sloan, one of the Secret Service men who guard the president, and said he was going to ask President Wilson to assign Sloan to expose scientists who he said were trying to make him a victim. Okay, so far, not so crazy. This guy, Marchant, is smart and methodical. He studied up, and he picked the best Secret Service guy to defend his brains, like he was picking the guy with the best throwing arm for his dodgeball team, or picking the best Pokemon to take down Squirtle. Also, nice to get historical verification that as far back as 1913, there was nothing secret about the Secret Service. But here now is the best part. I am a fan of weird history, and this made my heart beat in a devious, unhealthy little syncopation. The article reads, Mr. Marchant says scientists were opening skulls in large numbers in transferring the brains of clever people to the empty heads of fools. They had been trying to take his brains away, he said, but so far he had managed to elude them. And then, with that, the article just ends. There is no follow-up, no analysis of what led him to think a cabal of scientists were scooping brains out of smart people like ice cream and dumping them into the waffle cones of idiots. I mean, in a way, that's cool. Because if something like this happened now, CNN would cover it for months. They would give the story a clickbait name like Brain Swap 2016 or Head Pirates, colon, do you know where your child's brains are? There would be a graphic of some Bill Nye-looking motherfucker popping a skull open and then question marks would fly out of it and explode. 
Wolf Blitzer and Anderson Cooper would be fitted with helmets to protect their allegedly clever brains as they interviewed scientists about the great brain robbery epidemic. Neil deGrasse Tyson would have a heart attack live on air as he desperately attempted to debunk the science behind brain scooping. Polls would be conducted to determine exactly how many clever people there are in America versus fools to work out the economy of brain swapping. Are there enough clever brains to go around? Millions of terrified Americans would act even stupider to make sure no one wanted their brains. We'd take selfies looking as dull and dead-eyed as humanly possible and hashtag them no clever. So, long story short, maybe it's good that poor paranoid Arthur A. Marchant didn't have access to social media because if he did, he would have been terrified to discover the ratio of clever to fools was not in his favor. Anyway, on to everyone's favorite part of podcasts, the plugs. If you enjoy Obsessed Podcasts, you can support us by becoming a backer on Patreon. For as little as one buck a month, you'll get access to our monthly patron-only bonus episodes. Full info is on patreon.com slash josephscrimshaw. Or you can support all of the artists on the Feral Audio Podcast Collective by shopping at Amazon through our portal. Just go to feralaudio.com, click the Support Our Artists button, and go buy anything on Amazon, and some of the money will go to supporting Feral Audio. It does not even matter what you buy on Amazon. This week, I'm recommending you go buy a product entitled Triple Eight Brain Saver Rubber Helmet with Sweat Saver Liner. It's a nice generic helmet that comes in many colors and sizes and will make it extra difficult for Bill Nye to steal your your brain and give it to a dummy. Finally, shows. I do shows. I've got a bunch of shows coming up in LA, and I'll be a guest of honor at Convergence in Minnesota over the 4th of July weekend. If you're in San Francisco, we're doing a live episode of Obsessed about Netflix with guests Bonnie Burton and Rebecca Watson at Docs Lab on Wednesday, June 22nd. Please join us. For tickets and full info on all my shows, go to josephscrimshaw.com slash live dash shows. But for now, Put on a business suit, put your earbuds in, find some halls of power to stride down and look all important and presidential as you enjoy T.J. Chambers' obsession with The West Wing. Obsessed. Hello and welcome to Obsessed with me, Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm sitting in my home with an awesome human being, T.J. Chambers. Hello, thank you so much. Thanks for having me in your home. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Are you okay with me describing you as awesome? Uh, I'm okay with it so far. I will d attempt to do whatever I can over the next 45 minutes or so to prove my unawesomeness. <laughs> but for now, let's start there. Okay, you're starting up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll, we'll lose Lofty awesome ambitions. points. That's what I'm all about. All right. <laughs> Demerits will pile up as we move on. But for right now, let's start it awesome. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, well, let's talk about your nouns. You're, would you say you're a, a writer, a comedian, a producer, a man about town? I would I would say writer. That's my main sort okay. of vocation. Uh, for the last couple of years, just because television is a fickle beast, they've, yeah. they've called me or, or used me as a producer okay. a, a good amount. Um, that sounds like a weird thing. To, I would never in a bar walk up. I'm a producer. <laughs> sounds like a weird thing. So like, yeah, I started as a comedian, still am in my heart. Um, most of my paychecks come from writing for television. Yeah. Okay. And are you okay talking about what you're working on now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I just, because it's been announced in the trades, the whole thing's cool. Uh, I'm in the first week of a really fun uh, project essentially kind of a talk show format, but the Sci Fi Network broadcasting live from Comic Con from San Diego. Oh, Comic -Con. awesome! Yeah, so we got a whole big outdoor set that looks over the convention center. And uh, the one thing I won't mention yet is the host until that gets fully locked in, but it's going to be really cool. And uh, so for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night from San Diego Comic Con, we'll be broadcasting live from there. Awesome. So I'm writing that. Well, you, oh, you, so you're writing it? Yeah, writing host copy, writing bits, writing field pieces to do, you know, that, that whole kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Will it be live then, did you say? From... It'll be live. It'll be, I mean, imagine it literally just like an episode of Conan. Okay. It's live there. You'll do kind of a monologue -y thing. We'll talk to some guests. We'll have pre-taped packages, you know, okay. that we roll in. So, yeah. So, literally, boom, live, live. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, every day, West Coast time, 5 p.m. on the Sci-Fi Network. So, eight, I, they'll probably delay it, I guess, for the West Coast. Yeah. But... I love any more reach out from Comic Con. San Diego in particular. I like how that has become like the ambassador to normal people of these are what the, the geek people do. Yeah. The people who like the flash a little bit too much. Here's what they're up to. Right, right, right. And that's the kind of the hope is I mean, I've and I know as, as you have, like I've gone to Comic Con for years and years mm -hmm. and seen it grow and seen it blow up. And they're at a point now where they're they're maxed out. No one else can go. It's, right. It's full. So the hope is to say Hey, you, you, you know, you live in Kansas. You couldn't fly out here. You couldn't get a batch, couldn't get a hotel room. Here's what happened to the panels today. Here's yeah. what 
you know, boom, let's talk to Ben Affleck and see what's up with the next Justice League, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's that's what I'm working on right now. Oh, that's really cool. And but... that comes in stark contrast from the show I immediately wrapped a few weeks ago was Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> so <laughs> Another big geek property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well known amongst the nerds. I don't know if you guys, how you did in your fantasy Dancing with the Stars leagues. <laughs> uh, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah not so it's Terrible. Well. I put everything on Billy D. Williams. And he wasn't even in it this season, right? This season. They had this season, Geraldo Rivera was the Billy D. Williams. Geraldo Rivera like, was in it? Geraldo Rivera, essentially a man in his 70s. It's the exact template of Billy D. A man in his <laughs> 70s who has a physical ailment which precludes him from dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and we put him on Dancing with the Stars. That's what happened this year. Is it just like a close-up of his face making sexy gestures, he, face he gestures? Just, and to his credit, man, Geraldo was so game, he just smiled. And he kind of did whatever steps he could while his amazingly sexy Polish partner, Edita, danced <laughs> around him. And he was willing to do whatever. He, in the second episode, he put on a fake tan and a Trump wig and the the... the the idea of the dance was one year into the Trump administration, <laughs> his dancer plays Melania or whatever. It was yeah. like an acid trip. It was insane. Yeah. Uh, and he, he couldn't dance a lick, so he got voted off immediately. Do you get to decide things like that? Is, is a writer producer where you like, what should we do with sexy non moving Geraldo? I mean, I, so my end of it was specifically more kind of the pre tit comedy packages. Okay. And then our behind the scenes show. Yes, there's a room full of people. Uh, deciding the creative, although actually to their credit, the dancers individually choreograph the dances and do a lot of that creative themselves. Oh, really? So they really is like figure out what to do with Geraldo. That's cool. And I'm okay. sure a producer was like, by the way, he's friends with Donald Trump, and they were like, aha, I know what we'll do. You know? Yeah, excellent. So that's that. So let's talk a little bit about your obsession. You're mm -hmm. here to talk about the West Wing. Oh yes, I am. So can you try to describe the West Wing to people who have never seen it? Sure. The West Wing. Almost bridges, I could almost put television into pre and post West Wing okay. <laughs> eras in that it was prestige television in a way that we're so used to now uh, that so many shows actually have a lofty ambition of almost film level of quality. Right. And The West Wing to me was one of the first shows and certainly for a network mainstream show. It is a show about a fictional presidential administration and more specifically about the senior staffers who work for that president and their sort of daily trials and tribulations uh, trying to run the country as best they can. Okay, cool. So do you feel like it is influencing things like Scandal that are dealing with the West Wing White House stuff now? Yeah, yeah. I think that any anytime the West Wing, I think, helped prove that audiences could be smart enough that you could sort of stay out ahead of them and kind of do, uh, you know, bring them on on those things and trust that they would, uh, they'd be smart enough to stick with it. Okay. So, I, you know, I think those shows, certainly, you know, your House of Cards, your Scandal that are doing that kind of political intrigue stuff, that groundwork was laid, you know, the West Wing had to assume that you knew what a minority whip was in the okay. Senate and why that mattered. So and nobody would, turned to you and said, a minority so, whip. I mean, you, you know, and just like every show does, they would sort of write in a character. In the West Wing, there's a character, Donna, who is the assistant of one of the main guys, with the original idea being, oh, she represents the audience. Okay. So anytime we need to turn to someone and say, well, the minority whip of the Senate is the person who counts and wrangles votes uh, for the minority party, whatever, you'd be saying it to her. Okay. But eventually she became smart enough that they just, they just ran with it. And oh, that's the awesome. The audience would go with it. So she's like a companion on Doctor Who. Like, they've gotten smarter over the years. Yes, like, that's a very, that's an excellent ex analogy. Don't yeah, explain yeah. that to me. Yeah. Uh, cool. So do you remember the moment you got hooked on West Wing? I very much do. Before I landed permanently in Los Angeles, I kind of moved here back and forth. And I would come and I would work. I was the mailroom guy at Miramax for a while. And I, would get, <laughs> I would get sick of being poor and I'd move back to Phoenix or something. And in one of those times, probably about 2004... I was living out here and I was dead broke, so I couldn't leave the apartment. All I could afford to do was like eat rice and drink Pepsi. And a friend had left <laughs> the box set of the first three seasons of The West Wing at the apartment. Okay. And it was just my free entertainment. Did and they bring it to you knowing it will cost money for it, TJ to literally they open the door? I lent it to my roommate at the time. Uh, so they were just sort of ancillary left there, but he okay. was like a busy bee worker who had no time to watch such things. <laughs> And I was like, well, you know who does have time is me. <laughs> so kind of by happy accident. And it was, I mean, this is pre-Netflix. So it was like a binge watch before that was yeah. a huge thing, you know. Yeah, there was that weird, cool window where DVDs were introducing yeah. us to the concept of binge watching, which Netflix obviously has perfected. Yeah. 
the yeah, art of and and even the price point. I mean, I remember when I bought the X Files DVDs, the box set of the season was one hundred and twenty dollars, <laughs> and I went, well, that actually makes sense because it's twenty four episodes at an hour each. That's essentially twelve movies, twelve two hour long movies, <laughs> and at twenty dollars per DVD. For twelve movies, that's that's uh, you know that's two hundred forty. But I'm saving whatever it is. It was only after a while that they realized like no one wants to pay one hundred twenty dollars for a whole. But it was such a novel thing at the time. I have the whole season of television in this box. Yeah, and I can watch it all at one sitting. Great. You know? When you watched the first season of X Files, did you say I really got my money's worth? Not the first season. Oh, Scully's <laughs> hair. Scully's hair. First season, very poofy. Uh, yeah, X Files, like West Wing and some similar other shows. I mean, West Wing hit the ground running really well, but season two kind of really sings and okay. obviously x-files like was season two was where it finally became yeah something um, worth watching amazing right? yeah how many seasons were left in your home uh three the first three seasons okay so you're looking at that and you're saying this is how much time did you think it was going to take you to absorb it probably looking at it it was so daunting i was like there's no way i'm gonna watch all three seasons of this thing <laughs> and much like binging happens yeah one finishes another starts whatever next thing you know you've realized you've burned through nine ten episodes yeah. that day and all of a sudden it became very likely that in a week and a half two week period which is exactly what happened i made it through all three seasons okay so you just dove in and you were hooked right away yeah were you cognizant of the fact when you were watching it the first time that this is going to be something that's like meaningful to me like not, not at all because it was on t it was still on the tr tail end of tv at okay. that time it was still like season six i think on television so something I'd heard of for forever, and it just honestly seemed, you know, I was like, lost, that's sexy and fun. This show about <laughs> politics, people talking politics, boo, thumbs down. <laughs> you know, it, I, I had every opportunity to seek it out before then, and I never did. So yeah. it was just the circumstance of it sitting there before me and me having nothing else to do that caused me to watch it. And okay. And get instantly hooked, yeah. How did you feel when you're sitting there, poor, eating rice, mm -hmm. saying, I don't want to leave? And I'm watching the story of the most powerful people on the planet. Inspired, I guess, almost yeah. in a word. It was, I was kind of at a listless time and and just watching people. I, and one hand, it's, it's the most powerful people on the planet, but more specifically, it's the, it's sort of the smartest, most dynamic people on the planet. Okay. Who work behind the scenes and for the most powerful people on the planet. Okay. And it really showed me that like... It's okay to to be to try to be as smart as you can be, to, to try to be the smartest person in the room, to try to solve a problem with intellect and compassion and working together with like-minded people. Okay. You know, it, that was kind of the thing I took away. When you're working on shows now and you're like, fuck, we got to do something with Geraldo. Yeah. Do you think like, what would President Bartlett do? I think, what would Josh Lyman do? Okay. Who, he was the Bradley Whitford character, who's the deputy chief of staff. Who, okay. Like, is... It became a perfect ensemble on that show to where no one really rose above anybody else. But if you had had to call it a main kind of a main character, the original conceit of the show was was sort of him at the forefront. OK. And what I do think is the thing about that, the, that show and what I like to believe that the real West Wing is like is the spirit of collaboration. That okay. is, this room is the eight smartest of us in the world. We can tackle this problem if we do it together. And I certainly carry that into my work okay. now. Sort that, of the idea that there's not gonna that there isn't an easy answer. Yeah. That you just have to find something and that that's it's a problem. Okay that it's not the easy answer. Yeah. The great thing that the West Wing says is there's a great line where there's you know, there's, a, there's something that's happening, some issue that's thorny, and the chief of staff uh, keeps trying to keep the president out of it. And at some point he says to him like, it, you know, it's too difficult for this office. I don't want it in here in the Oval Office. And the president says to him, I don't ever want to hear it's too difficult for this office. Which is a great point. Yeah. If there's anyone in the world who's going to be able to get through this thorny issue, it had better be the president and his staff of amazing, you know, whiz brains. Yeah. And and that idea of wanting to be the one who tackles the tough thing, you know, is comes from that show. Yeah. Well, how many times have you watched it now? So you binge watched the first three seasons. Uh -huh. I imagine you watched the rest as they were broadcast. I, yeah. Then I yeah. Then I caught up to the broadcast and watched the broadcast. I have since then now gone back, probably. So the, the, the nerdy thing, seasons one through four were all almost exclusively written, but show run by Aaron Sorkin, okay. the great Aaron Sorkin. He <laughs> left at the end of season four. Uh, it got, you know, he was doing piles of cocaine to stay up all night and write the show or whatever he left. Some West Wing purists, and I know you're out there, feel free to tweet me, <laughs> it just after season four, stop watching. It's not an Aaron Sorkin show anymore. 
He's not directly in control. I don't want anything else to do with it. The characters, to me, are the really compelling part. And so season five, I certainly continue in into that. The final seasons, six and seven, represent sort of a seismic shift in what the show is about. Okay. Uh, so I've watched one through four, I'm going to say at least ten times. Okay. All the way through. Wow. Five, three, four times, and then six and seven a couple of times. Okay. I've had the West Wing pushed on me mm-hmm. almost to uh, the wire level. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean that in any way like I don't want to watch it. I've just never, I, I have never made time for the West yeah. Wing in specific. And people have set it up as like, you need to sit right. down yeah, and with that wide take eye, it like, in. Yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, it's Become gonna, one of us. <laughs> exactly. It's like yeah. LSD. Well, and when people do that, it's almost inherently off-putting because it implies that it's going to be harder work than it is. Yeah. When they say like, you need to spend some time with this and get into it. You're like, well, how hard is it going to be? You know? Yeah. Where I want it to be like, Hey man, trust me, you whip on that first episode. You better watch yourself. Yeah. Because then you're, you're going to lose the whole rest of your day. I'm you more know? afraid of that because yeah. I, you know, I'm obsessive. That's why I do this podcast. Right. And I am afraid of, I don't want to watch a good show. Yeah. Let me watch yeah. some crap that I can stop. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, the bonus is that it's already done. It's modular. Right. So you know you're not getting into some potentially decades long. It's sort of the, the thing with Abed on Community when he, you know, he realizes someone tells him about Doctor Who, whatever it is, uh-huh. and that it's like, oh, no, now we need to find Abed another 50 years long <laughs> running show you know, that he can get into for forever because yeah. he's too scared of the notion of it ending. Yeah. With your obsession, at least knowing that there's like – a finite amount. Yeah, and I would know. look forward to the crappier seasons too. Because yeah. sometimes I like crap. Yeah. And to know that, oh, this is going to be great for a while and then it's going to fall off. It's like this beautiful little drama. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. life. <laughs> or it's sort of like can use about the moment where it falls off. I mean, and even, I, this is obviously me singing the praises of a show I'm obsessed with, but crap is, you know, sure, it's not as good as okay. the other, but it's still better than 95% of what's ever been on television. Okay. It's just that now it's Jimmy Smits and Alan Alda who were not, previously cast members okay because it's tied to the real chronology the Bar- for the president bartlett administration is reaching the end and you now need new candidates to run yeah to become a new president which is great but that show had painted itself into a corner where you're kind of like well i want to watch the people i knew and loved for for five years yeah who are these new guys you know yeah like it happens with real presidents sometimes yeah <laughs> i mean really yeah, yeah. so did the show ever affect any of your opinions about real life politics yeah, let me let me think of specific examples. I would say that it did. I mean, a show like that does a great job of devil's advocating because it was they were clearly even though it was a fictional administration, they were they were absolutely unabashed Democrats. Okay, they said they were Democrats. They were you know in opposition to the Republican Party. So it would have been easy to fall down a slope of just their rah rah shaking pom poms for every Democratic ideal. Yeah, but you know when it's organic to uh, a character who would voice you know, in opposition to that, did so. Oh, cool. So, you know, God, there, you know, there are things like, it was probably the first time I realized even something with the minimum wage where I thought deeply into it enough that on the surface you just want to go, well, yeah, raise the minimum wage. Everyone should make more money. Of yeah. Course. More money, better. And then you have a character going, well, but actually that's a domino that's going to affect all these other things that might cause less small business spending, that might increase tax liability, therefore, yeah. you know, whatever, where... You can say, okay, I still come down on the side of the issue where I think we should raise the minimum wage. But wow, I I, I would not have thought it was that yeah. nuanced or in-depth of an issue, you know. Did it ever make you want to go into politics once you started wrapping your head around like, ah, minimum wage, that's a problem. Uh, yeah, I can do it. I, I mean, can do it. I, for a brief, I was so inspired by <laughs> the show and specifically the character, Josh Lyman, the aforementioned one, that I had like... You know, out of college, I'd gone to film school, and then it kind of was clear I wasn't going to become a filmmaker. And I accidentally sort of took the law school entrance exam at one point <laughs> on, on like a weird lark. How did you accidentally? Was I it had a dare? A girlfriend who's now a lawyer, good for her, who at the time she had taken the LSAT like four or five times and wasn't doing well enough to get into the law school that she wanted to get into. Okay. She was super nervous about it. And I was like, well, I'll take it with you. I'll go down there. We'll make a day of it. It'll be fine. That Damn. way someone else is there who's doing it. Because it's, it's like 80 bucks to take the test. Yeah. And I just went down. I had no idea what kind of questions were on it. <laughs> I had no idea how the test went. 
but I think being that relaxed sort of accidentally made me do really well. Yeah, so I'm I'm totally ignorant. Is this just the be a lawyer now test? It's the it's the it's the LSAT is the law school uh, entrance exam, the law okay. school aptitude test. Okay. So if you've graduated college and you want to be admitted to law school, okay, just like you take the SAT when you've graduated high school, you want to be admitted to college. Okay. There's the law school SAT. Okay. Uh, which would get you in. in you, the, the bar exam is maybe what right. you're thinking of, which is literally be a lawyer. Yeah, I, I was thinking that's not possible. Yeah, that, that's not possible. <laughs> like, yeah, I got yeah. 80 bucks. Can that's I be a lawyer? Some, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Simpsons well, that's reality. Like the catch me if you can days or whatever. Where it was like, <laughs> trust me, I'm a lawyer. See, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is just the entrance exam. So, so, but, so but you pass. I, I did. It, it's just like the SATs. It's a sliding scale. Okay. Of, you know, whatever. But I did well enough that I got scholarship offers from law schools in the mail <laughs> and and then my mom would be like well you should go to law school and i was like but i want to be quentin tarantino or whatever <laughs> so when the west wing so inspired me i was like maybe i'll go to law school that way i can be you know the deputy chief yeah. of staff of the white house or whatever uh and then luckily thought better of it yeah because there was a it's not nearly as sexy as it seems on a show Mm-mm. uh but b i'm not built for that kind of rigorous academia yeah like, so did you just quick sidebar? Speaking of lawyer stuff, mm-hmm. did Ooh, your good, good one? Yeah, good one. I, I got to recover yeah, now. You may approach the bench. Yeah. <laughs> did, how did your girlfriend do? Did you do better than her? She, um, I, I did do better than her, uh, but not by that much. And she did well enough that she, and she's a lawyer. Eventually, now, right. she's now okay. a lawyer. And did did that end the relationship when you did better? We, with, actually, I, than I, her? I, I'm even by even saying because she was my ex girlfriend at the time. We okay, were still just really good friends. So luckily that wasn't a relationship pressure okay. thing. We were just ex. Yes. Yeah. So, but you, through this experience, you learned. So like, once I, I kicked get... her ass on the LSAT, <laughs> yeah, pew, pew, suck it. No, I'm just uh, uh, so yeah. you realize that you could maybe do it, but it's not ultimately what you want to do. Yeah. It's not, you don't have the temperament for it. Well, it's the thing. All Good art, I think, has two interesting things. So it's a good television show or a good movie. There's a level of it, which is good enough that it makes you go, oh, I want to make movies. Yeah. You know? Wow, Pulp Fiction was really good. I want to make a movie like that. And then there's a level where it affects you so much, you want to actually do the thing that happened in that thing. Yeah. And West Wing to me was so good. I didn't just want to write a good TV show like the West Wing. I was like, I want that to be my life. I want to be in that, you know. Right. And yeah, so that was one of them for me. But then I did think better of it. Yeah, well, that's better than Pulp Fiction. We're like, yeah, yeah I want to OD yeah, on yeah, right. drugs. And... I have uh, shoved a needle into at least five women's breastplates <laughs> since Pulp Fiction came out. Accidentally Apologies. shoot people. Apologies, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. So so you learned that you had that aptitude, but you wanted to imply it elsewhere. Right. Uh, it sounds to me, I read a little bit about West Wing on Wikipedia. I read about all of my obsessed subjects on Wikipedia, sure. so I know a little something. And I read that it was both criticized and sort of applauded for being optimistic maybe too optimistic right do you consider yourself an optimistic person did it match you or i do it... and it kind of matched it kind of matched that okay and, but it will every election you'll see someone tweet or whatever say like can we, well what if we could just elect bartlett bartlett 2016 <laughs> because you do want especially about this thing which is so important you know what that show showed me is i want the president of the united states to be the smartest most idealistic most moral most complex person in the world. Yeah. And that's what that show gave optimists like me. And, and this is part of the criticism an unrealistic expectation that that was maybe out there. So you don't believe that a person like that exists. You know, I I think that I, I, you know what? I believe that they do exist. I believe that our, the rigors of our system are set up such that they will never come to the fore in a political system. Okay. What part of that personality that sort of, uber calm smart person do you think our system destroys what would stop a real life bartlett from getting in office i think that way too early in the process you need to marshal the kind of ground level grinding grassroots okay uh at bureaucracy also you know it's that thing where you need you you can't just become a candidate for president you need <laughs> right. to have time traveled back two years and gotten some local municipal you know uh, director of a particular iowa caucus or whatever to be on your side to nominate your name to be put on a piece of paper you know etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah and that process kind of quelches that idealism i think to get through that sausage grinder to get to where you are yeah uh, you know possible on that you it's it has stripped away whatever 
uh, or at least a lot of that optimism and idealism that you have. Right. Like you're just going to be a little bit pissed by the time you walk into the yeah. Oval Office, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the same way that it's a different skill, you know, every year at the Oscars, there's sure best actor is whoever gave the best performance. But it's also a lot of times who shook the most hands at parties beforehand. Right. Skills that are in any in, a lot of times almost directly opposed to actually purely acting. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is the thing. It's just our, this, the system has too many barriers of entry to let, uh, you know, happy people whistle in and, and try to do their thing. Right. Okay. So in a way, the show made you like a very uh, pragmatic optimist. Yeah. You're like, I believe in the best. Right. But it's probably not going to happen. I believe in the best, but it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is a very democratic more specifically the Democratic Party ideal anyway. Yeah. For instance, and this would be an issue, you know, something like that show brought to my front. You look at something like Needle Exchange and a, and a really right wing conservative Republican would say, no, I won't I won't have any federal dollars supporting drug people doing more drugs. Right. That's absolutely not going to happen. It's absurd, which is fine. That's a lofty idea. I wish nobody did intravenous drugs through needles also. Yeah. But they do. So what a Democrat yeah. <laughs> will say is let's lessen the burden on our health care of taking care of these HIV infected people or trying to whatever. And at least say that since they're going to do it, let's have them do it in a way that's not spreading disease. Right. You know, it's passing out condoms at schools. It's all that same thing. It's pragmatic idealism. You right. Know, I wish that we did. I wish that no kids had sex under whatever age, but they do. Let's try to make it so they don't have babies. <laughs> Come on, guys. Right. And you can, uh, that seems really good to apply to the kind of work that you do where you're coming up with like the ideal idea, but then maybe somebody doesn't want to do it or like maybe Ben Affleck just shows up real sad that day. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Just like, well, yeah, yeah. As, Ben Affleck is sad. we will tell you that he, he very often is. <laughs> yeah, like, and that's the thing that like, you know, I get to write for TV shows and it's amazing, but I also have to sit down and have a meeting with a lawyer who tells me why we can't do this or that bit because okay. of this or that reason. So it's exactly that. You're like, the dream idea is this. Now let's find the best version of that that we can get through a network executive, right. talent, a legal wrangling, budget, and still have it try to come out on the other end the closest to our original pure vision that we had. That's a really great way to look at that sort of pragmatic optimist uh, divide of like, my job is to come up with dreams that are going to get shit on a little bit. Right. And I'll right. try to keep this. And to, yeah, to keep them as unsmeared in shit <laughs> as is possible, you know, throughout that process. Yeah. So smeared in shit is a great segue to the yeah, next yeah, thing yeah. I wanted to ask you. Oh, is this time uh, for a sponsor? Th you know, yeah, kind of like, <laughs> smeared in shit is a great segue to Dollar Shave Club. <laughs> Smear your yes, face and yeah. not shit. Yeah, there you go. The, the show is really known for all of the witty, snappy dialogue, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really, this is the show where Sorkin really made his name, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. As being the king of snappy, snappy dialogue. Yeah. So if you could have Sorkin write something for you, like write a part of your life. Yeah. Has there ever been like a situation or you imagine a future situation where like, I wish Sorkin could write this interaction could be here for to... me so I could just crush it. Yeah. It's for my, for my snappy repartee. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be. Almost every professional interaction <laughs> really yeah. would be. And, and what I wish is that what Sorkin was able to do with that was to make every character elevated to that level. Okay. So they're all as snappy in their own particular unique to their character way, but as snappy and as quick and sharp as people can be. So I suppose what I wish is that what he could bestow on any conversation I was having <laughs> was the idea that that's the bar we're trying to clear. It's okay to be as smart as you can be. Okay, so you would want Sarkin to basically come into the room when you're talking to a, a lout, yeah, a dumb person, and, and say... Say, like, everybody, let's bring it up. No, no, <laughs> take it up I, a notch. I mean, and not so much a lout, but that not, you know, it's not that there are people who are incapable of, of reaching that level. It's that there are people who, for whatever reason, think that it's uncouth to do that okay you know it's it's the george bush and on notion of like folksiness is, ah. is he's more earnest and honest like if you're talking fast and using big words you're trying to pull something over on me right and that's why and you know i know that people's minds are engines that could be revved to a higher level than a lot of times they are they just for whatever reason don't want to look like the one who's trying to be the smartest person in the room or whatever oh yeah i mean every once in a while i use a big word and i have a moment where like I just couldn't think of any other word so yeah. I use the big word yeah. and then it, there is sometimes the record scratch effect right. yeah right <laughs> right 
Why the hell did you say crepuscular? Yeah. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't think of Twilight, so mind. I said crepuscular. Yeah. I'm, an, I'm an asshole. Uh, would you ever want him to write like for a relationship? That is where I would veer away from that. <laughs> Not that the relationships there are hugely dysfunctional, but like, well, it's a perfect example. Of the, you know, the sort of things that he perfected on the West Wing become that opening scene of The Social Network. Okay. With Jesse Eisenberg and, and Rooney Mara's character there, which is just an eight minute uninterrupted chunk of relationship bullshit artifice stripped back. Yeah. And, and just pure dialogue between two people in a relationship. And it's very harrowing. Yeah. You know, it, I, I, relationships are the one time that I'm kind of OK with the notion that like we all admit that we're bullshitting a little bit because <laughs> it's better for everybody involved. Right. Than really just opening up the raw, you know, whatever it is. Right, because you're not trying to solve the world's problems. You're not like, hello, let's go on a date and figure out needle exchange. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're, yeah, you're right. It, it, you're matching your level of dialogue to the ambition of what you're right. trying to do, you know. In a relationship, you're like, I'm trying to, yeah, we're not trying to solve a problem. We're not trying to unbox a riddle. We're trying to <laughs> enjoy each other's company, and we don't need to be, you know, operating at our maximum Right. Percentage or whatever. Whereas if there is a problem, you know, professionally or, or socially that you're trying to solve, then maybe that's the time for intellect. Yeah, it's all about that sort of appropriateness of when to have that just a person you want to have a beer with. Yeah. Like, I yeah. don't want that for a politician. Well, I don't want that for a leader. I want that for somebody that I'd have a yeah, beer with, have a beer like with. a friend yeah, or my yeah, wife. Yeah. Right. And I want and that and that was the, that's the optimism criticism of the West Wing is it's like. I don't want everyone to be on some pedestal. Yeah. I want the top eight people in the government to be on a pedestal. Right. You had better. This is a nation of 340 million people or whatever it is. You'd better be able to find eight people who are <laughs> smarter than anyone I have ever met. Right. As well as, you know, earnest and honest and hardworking or whatever. And if you can't, then well, then what the hell? Yeah. Does that make you mad in real life? The just want to have a beer with them kind of attitude about politics when people want to vote for someone that they can have a beer with? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's not. No, it, it kind of goes both ways because some people like Bill Clinton had both sides of that. Yeah. I'd be like, I want to have a beer with Bill Clinton. I also believed that he was a policy wonk who could wrap his head around the biggest issues. Right. From the sense that the president and possibly their most important function is to represent America's face to the rest of the world. OK. The have a beer with thing is important. Right. I just like to believe that you can find someone who has the beer thing as well as being able to back it up. Right. With, you know, Obama is a cool motherfucker. I would like He's to a have a smooth dude. I would like to have a beer with Obama yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I don't know why I feel like he'd be a Roman Coke guy or something random. He like would that. be something kind of fancy, kind of but back, kind yeah. of earthy too. A little something, not yeah, not like a full on mixed cocktail, but like but, yeah, it, almost a cocktail, yeah, but not yeah, quite. Yeah. Uh, but he's, I, you know, he's that cool dude oh yeah and i also absolutely believe that he's one of the smartest people in every room he ever walks into oh yeah and so, i feel like he could retire just on i pay me three thousand dollars to come have a rum and coke with me for half yeah, an hour oh, yeah and so many people New would do business it. model <laughs> my man barry O. if you're out there and you're trying to figure out what to do after this I think that's my new life goal. Him. You honestly just described him as a high class escort. <laughs> you actually just you're like there are people who get paid three thousand dollars to have a rum and coke with people, but just a rum and coke. <laughs> yeah, just and it's not a euphemism. Yep, not at all. No, yep. <laughs> and there's no other drinks are allowed. Yeah, can't get any other yeah, yeah, drinks. Just that. Right, yeah, right, no yeah. watermelon shooters yeah. with the president. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, the other famous thing I think from the West Wing that I knew about before even researching it was the whole walk and talk yeah. scene idea. Mm -hmm. So was that brand new and fresh to you when you first saw it? Were you already aware of it culturally? I mean, e ER was doing it too. I okay. think both of those shows, but ER obviously with the sort of wheeling someone through. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> it's and, the and roll and, and talk. It, right, yeah. the roll and talk, which is... Yeah, the West Wing was it just bore out of a function of something anyone learns in film school, which is like, this is a visual medium. Yeah. We can't just have two people sitting in a room talking, you know, hey, let's have them walk and talk. And the physics of the set they built, it's just on a soundstage. They built an amazing replica of the Oval Office, of the offices, of the whatever. But it clearly is a sort of Mobius maze or, or almost an MC Escher thing. Okay. Where you realize they can they can block it in such a way that they're essentially walking in circles, but to the camera that's tracking with them, seems like they're walking around a huge office building. Right, so you they know? don't have to cut. They can just keep so walking and talking can, forever. Yeah, yeah, for a solid chunk, which has to have been an actor's, I mean, 
the number of people going like the new OMB projections have deficit down 3%, but also what's happening in the Nikkei index is the yen is up four against the dollar or whatever. I can't even imagine the work these people had to go yeah. to memorize this shit. I can imagine, I've done a decent amount of acting, uh, and I can imagine being the main walker, the person who's in charge, who's doing like the full walk. Right. But I would lose my shit being the guy who just pops up and real quick says like, oh, here's your coffee, yeah, sir. alongside and then, and then, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I have the paranoia of like, I'm going to fuck up your uh, shot oh, every time. good point. Yep. Yeah, you don't time it out well. And then now some huge stuff. Allison Jenny has to go back <laughs> and do this whole thing again. Here's your crafty coffee. coffee. Yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. damn it. Oh, man. You know, I never really thought about it though, from that respect that the people who have to parachute into those. Yeah. You know, almost, yeah. And who I, who I assume are sitting there sort of almost in track blocks, like they're starting the 100-meter <laughs> dash. Yeah. You know, whatever. And then the camera gets to them and they swoop in. Uh, but yeah, that was, and the, every every subsequent, the people from the West Wing have gotten together to shoot a PSA for, you know, awareness about whatever. Yeah. And that's sort of the wink and laugh every time you do something. They do a walk and like, talk. Let's talk. Oh, walk with me. Oh, we're doing this again. You know, whatever okay. thing. Okay. So you obviously work at places where it's a lot of different people working together. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine like having to run to this office, run to that office. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself doing an actual walk and talk? Yeah. I mean, never. I, most of my offices are so crappy. We don't have that much space. <laughs> this one right now, we're on kind of a giant floor of the NBC Universal building. So okay. I'm going to have to like organize a walk and talk. Yeah. A lot of times what I always laugh about with television and I've, of the like 11 or 12 shows I've worked on in the development phase, you want to, there's a big fancy, you open the doors open to the office for the, where the development and the meetings happen when you're pitching the network and there's a waterfall and a secretary and a thing. <laughs> Once the, the show is actually happening and they go, where are we going to put the writers? It's the dankest, crappiest <laughs> closet in a nondescript office building in North Hollywood. Right. Because there's no one to impress anymore. It's just like, let's save as much on the budget as we can. Right. So it's more like the sort of squat and talk. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> huddle, huddle and talk under, yeah. So yeah, my office is very often in, in weird. A couple shows ago, I was writing a show for True TV, and our office was in a building that part, most of the building was taken up for like a for-profit college. Okay. So there'd be people in scrubs learning how to administer IVs or something like that. The third floor was the elderly Jewish rehab center. And they must have had like a gym or something right above us. So it was like, Moshe, lift this three pound weight five times and then drop it to the <laughs> ground. So they would just be constantly dropping weights and things on the roof above us as we were writing a TV show. Oh, that sounds like a nice kind of pressure. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Everything yeah. is falling it apart. Didn't, it was the like the anti, like, hooray for Hollywood. <laughs> and it was just like, all right, kid, get in this crappy office. So if you could do a walk and talk, mm -hmm. if you could engineer one, either in a sort of real life setting, or I know you're a comic book, you're a geek guy, if you could do it with a geek character, is there anyone that you would want to walk and talk with? Oh, that I'd want to have that discussion with yeah like yeah you feel like there's this is deeply ironic but you feel like there's a good professor x role in talk <laughs> oh yeah for sure you had like just sort of on the way to some mutant issue you know, oh sort yeah of figuring out like what it is that that's gonna happen uh would would be a good one yeah yeah nightcrawler could literally pop yeah, in could, he could bamf in give the coffee bamf <laughs> right out, out. oh that's a good one yeah I like that yeah, so something political. Mm -hmm. Would you ever want to do a walk and talk with Batman? Batman is the the opposite. Like he's <laughs> like you just have to go to his shadow and Lasonic. Is it laconic or Lasonic? Laconic, I think. Yeah, yeah. and sort of uh, uh, not saying many words. See how I did because I don't know how to pronounce it. Said that. Yeah, but yeah, Batman, like the antithetical walk and right. talker, I think. He would not want to do that. Even yeah. Adam West is no. a stroller. Yeah. He wouldn't even move yeah, fast no, enough. Yeah, no, no, no. He saunters, Adam He's, West. He saunters. I mean, there's certainly a Deadpool walk and talk to be had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. It would that become would be insufferable great. after a certain uh, period of time. but <laughs> it would mostly be him making fun of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And being perhaps almost annoyingly ironic about it. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah, like just <laughs> almost too meta, but meta about how he's being too meta. Yeah. And then it's kind of okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm finally so I'm going to go Deadpool walk and talk. Deadpool walk and Before talk. Before we all get sick of his shit after the second movie. Yeah. <laughs> Which might happen. Yeah. Uh, you were acknowledging this earlier, but I like to sometimes pull quotes from Wikipedia, and I really like this one. It's a little bit long, but then there'll be a question. Mm -hmm. So Wikipedia said, Sorkin's hectic writing schedule often led to cost overruns and schedule slips. He opted to leave the show after the fourth season Season following personal problems, including an arrest for possession of hallucinogenic mushrooms. Oh, it's hallucinogenic mushrooms There's more specifically. always some beautiful detail in Wikipedia that may or may not be correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like citation me. needed, and you're like, all right, who cares? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question I wanted to ask you is, uh -huh. would you have preferred it if he stayed and did a fifth season 
just totally fucked up on shrooms. Just completely shroomed out. I think that a show like that, the like the train has left the station and the interplay with the characters is so perfect. I actually really would like to see someone who has those characters ingrained in his DNA like Sorkin would, yeah. but is fucked out of his mind on something. Because <laughs> it's one of the things I lament about you know pop culture or entertainment is the constant playing at safeness. Mm. You know, you've got you've built this amazing sandbox in which to play. It's mine not to get off on a tangent, but like my problem with the up, supposed upcoming Star Wars Rogue One reshoots, yeah, is they go, uh, oh, it turns out this movie was too dark. It was like a war movie, and it's not like the other Star Wars movies. And I, as a fan, go, yeah, it wasn't supposed to be like the other yeah. Star Wars movies. The idea was come play in the sandbox that is Star Wars. So to me, once you've built that amazing sandbox and you've let it run for a little bit, absolutely get weird with it. Yeah. So I think a season five of him just like getting wacky would be, it'd be more compelling television than someone else just trying to do a pale impression of what they think Sorkin's doing. Yeah. It seems to me, I have not watched West Wing. I will soon, but it seems Mm -hmm. to me it'd be fun if it was that that brilliant, snappy, blah, blah, blah. And then every once in a while, there's just a line out of the blue that is just meaningless. Like the dolphins are going to take our money. Yeah. yeah. like what? Have you ever seen a wall with walrus with braces? Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Cool. Well, since you make shows, Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if you, if we could build a new political show. Oh, I love it. In the yeah. shadow of West Wing. Yeah. So if you were going to make a political show like that, mm-hmm. and we got Scandal now, we got House of Cards, what what is the show? What kind of show? What what genre should like, a like new political show? What aspect have they not covered yet? Yeah, or, or do you want it to be a comedy? Do you want it to be a reality show? Like, yeah. what do you want it to be? I mean, it's interesting because both... The, the West Wing is surprisingly funny. Yeah. Veep is obviously very right. funny. So the tendency is to just go like a wacky comedy that takes place behind the scenes of the thing. But I think I would yeah. I instantly think, well, but both those shows already did that so well. I, I think that if you could get real unfettered docu like reality access. Oh wow. And you'd probably have to do something where you signed a deal that it would only come out however many years later. Okay. A- after that administration was out. Wow. But if, you know, truly compelling sort of documentary filmmakers followed that and could really get the access i think that that would be interesting okay do you have a political opinion uh, or guess about who is going to win this upcoming election if it's going to be hillary clinton or trump i, I think it's going to be hillary clinton i i have to keep thinking that we're going to come to some semblance of senses and say that like okay this was cute but it's it's insane we need someone who at least knows what they're doing yeah i so think if, yeah i i personally think that hillary will win yeah and i think that uh, a joke idea will finally become a reality and i think we're going to elect a real president and then we're just going to have a reality show where we elect a fun president right. as a side thing as a, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. just like this is the real person to take care of business right. and well, then this let's is the see what it would have been yeah. wouldn't it be crazy if yeah, the figurehead kind of thing or whatever? yeah yeah and then like when the real president makes important decisions you could have a little box pop up in the corner where <laughs> the, the, the fun president is like what, yeah do it like this is what yeah, i would have done translated through the fun president yeah yeah, yeah just uh, like doing an overdub track in the state of the union like not yeah. the way i would have gone with that <laughs> uh-uh yeah i would have shot them all yeah uh so okay hillary imagine hillary is in the office right and you're making a docudrama yeah. Uh, or just a documentary yeah. about Hillary. What do you, and, and her whole White House, what do you call it? Ooh, what do you call it? Are you call it under the pantsuit? No. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the, ooh, hey, everybody. Yo, what's up there? <laughs> Brainstorming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, well, just because it's so zeitgeisty right now, and if it's about all the other people who are working for her or whatever, I, you got, I guess you call it I'm with her. Oh, yeah. You know, but in kind of like an, you know, I'm with her, like, I work, that's my boss. I know. have made the choice, and now I'm with yeah, her, good yeah, or yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm with her, almost like, yeah, Yeah, that's a good point. Like, the, this is my lot in life. This yeah. is now my next four or eight years. I just follow her around and do whatever. Yeah. What con- What would you try to capture? Would you try to capture the personal reality of Hillary, or would you try to capture, like, the ramifications of her decisions on her employees? I think what you capture now is, you know, fast-forwarding nine months and saying that she's going into office, let's say that she will, she'll be certainly one of the older, uh, more in in Beltway experienced, you know, presidents that there is, which to me implies that her staff is going to have to be young fresh go-getters yeah and so i think the show is the juxtaposition between this embattled person who's been dealing with this crap for 30 years in her life and these 28 to 32 year old people 
you know, who've, who've graduated and worked at, you know, clerked for a couple of years and done a couple of things, but they're now, their battle is to explain to Hillary, you know, what, what their young idealistic side of things want to okay. do uh, versus her battle of, trust me, I've done this a million times and I know the way it's done and, and finding how we forge a new path you know that's independent that that's down the middle of both of those okay so it's kind of a story of generations yeah if you were going to be really manipulative and Mm -hmm. say man everything in this administration is kind of going smoothly and i'm not getting any drama if you're going to be just horrible what would you do to create drama i mean you you release a little bit of that footage to the opposition party i guess (laughs) everyone has to want to know i want to know what goes on behind closed doors yeah you know does Harry Reid slam the door shut and say, <laughs> Paul Ryan is a fucking idiot. And that little twerp, if I see him around, I swear to God, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to know that. And I think you could really ratchet things up by just giving a little bit of, a, of an insight into what each side was saying about the other. Yeah. Yeah. And also the typical reality to alcohol, man, you just, <laughs> just take them to the cantina for, for two for one tequila shot night, just like they do in the real world yeah. or big brother, any of those reality shows and sparks are guaranteed to fly. Just Hillary and Bernie, if he's involved at all or yeah. not doing some tequila shots, just knocking some back and, and talking really about hashing the past. It out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> someone's then all of a sudden someone's crying for no particular reason. And then things get emotional. Yeah, that's that's good reality TV. Yeah, and I like Hillary, but I think uh, I think she's got some great uh, eyes and a, some killer eyes. Like yeah. when she when she wants to kill you with oh, her man. eyes, yeah, she has the best murder eyes in the game. Yeah, and I think and that's the thing. That's I mean, I want to see footage of you know a young staffer making an honest but stupid mistake. That's going to be a problem for the Hillary administration and seeing her withering glare at that person. <laughs> Absolutely, I want to see that. Just cut to them collapsing yeah, to the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like Superman's laser beams, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen The West Wing? No. Do you have any idea at all what it is? No idea. Uh, something political? The West Wing. Mm. Was that a medical show? I've only seen it once. Yeah. Do you remember liking it? Not really, because when I watch something, I want it to take me away from reality, not watching the reality again. Have you ever seen The West Wing? Yes. Did you like it? Yes. Who was your favorite character? The president. Do you think it's possible for the president to be a good person? Not right now, no. In general? No, not right now. <laughs> Definitely. You have to have good morals and pride in America, you know, and doing the right thing for the people. Or else why would you be the president? I mean, if you're a president, to be a president for the glory and the, the money and the prestige, I think it, that's the wrong person to be a president. If you could have Aaron Sorkin write dialogue for your life, w- when would you use it? I think I would use it when I talk to my children. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. What do you think about that? I don't know. I don't understand any of this. So, Can you describe what a walk and talk is? A walk and talk is when you're having a meeting as you walk to a location. Do you ever do that? Do you ever do walk and talks? All the time. I work in advertising. We do it all the time. <laughs> yes. So instead of saying meet me in conference room A, you just say let's just walk and talk. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're going to move on to our how obsessed are you questions. I love it. So do you think about the West Wing every day? I would say pretty much every day, either a quote or a circumstance pops into my head, yes. Okay, so because it's just so ingrained at this point that you don't have to actively think about yeah, thinking and, about it? Yeah, and, and also just the, it's the most, the visual of people in an office communicating about work stuff, I've, you know, that the West Wing showed me is so seared into my brain okay. that I can't help but sit in an office and think about it that same way. Okay, you know? cool. Have you ever had a dream about the West Wing? Hmm, not particularly that I can remember. I mean, I, almost every time you're binging something, when you watch something until 3 o'clock in the morning, yeah. you go to sleep that night and have some dream about it. But... Yeah, I've had weird dreams about, like, the menu screen. Because, you know, you leave it on too long. Yeah. Like, you know, you're going to watch another episode, but you go to cook your mac and cheese or whatever. And then, yeah. <laughs> I was just on a podcast panel at a, a convention a week ago. Or, uh, uh, I should say, a DVD panel. A panel about DVDs. And I was recounting. I so specifically remember falling asleep to like the load screen of Chasing Amy. And that same like song plays again and again. And you sort of wake up six hours later, 
Like it's like Chinese water torture has been right. done to you. Right. And you uh, remember the instructions that you got Manchurian candidate yeah, like yeah, yeah, secretly yeah, embedded in that song. Now, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, to go work in a convenience store in New Jersey or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've definitely had West Wing dreams. They were probably folded in with panic dreams where it was okay. like I was thrust into one of those jobs and did not actually have the current fiscal annual report at my fingertips. Okay. You know, and someone was demanding figures on unemployment or whatever that I just didn't have. Right. So that's kind of standard, like be the best you can be that that show taught you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Would you name a child of your own after a character in the West Wing? I could see going with like a Josh or a Joshua for Josh Lyman. I could see, I mean, Sam Seaborn. It's not the best name in the world. President Josiah Bartlett. Josiah's a little bit of an old name. Josiah's a little weird. Yeah. On the lady side. Well, see, much like me, the character Allison Jenny plays is C.J. Craig, uh, which is short for Claudia Jean. Okay. I'm a T.J., which is short for something. So the idea of taking <laughs> initials, I could have, I could pretend like I was just taking it from C.J. Craig. Okay. Where it's also coming from my own life. Are your own, the truth of your own initials a secret? No, no, no. It's, you just, like to it's share? just that it's weird because it's, my, uh, the T.J. stands for Thomas Jr. Okay. My name's Thomas Edward Chambers Jr. And sometimes I'll tell people like, they'll go, where's the T.J. come from? And I'm like, well, my name's Thomas Edward Chambers Jr., and they go, yeah, well, where's the J? And I'm like, Chambers Jr. And they just don't get that it's not my middle name. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, fair enough. So, so it's that's, got, the, that's, that's a damn dignified name. It's, it is like an automatic country club membership. <laughs> Until I get Thomas Edward Chambers the third. Yeah. And his initials are TEC, and I can call him Tech 3 or something like that. <laughs> or Trip. Then then it's on. Yeah. That's great. So you'd probably go with uh, Josh. i go with Josh. Yeah. Or Seaborn. That's the last name. Sam, the... Sam Seaborn. Sam Seaborn. Is, is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is Rob Lowe's character's name. I hope I really like this show and have a child, because I would love to just give a child the first name Seaborn. Seaborn. Yeah, that's <laughs> Cool. People think it's that from Game also, of Thrones. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say Game of Thrones esque. Like it would sound like a bastard kid that you had on a ship out in you know, yeah. sort of like Jon Snow, John Seaborn. There's a, a great Star Wars uh, book that that has a character named Joff Sea Striker that I just oh. read, and I'm just in love with Sea Striker. Yeah, and that's Seaborn's going back to pretty... the old Luke Star Killer, just kind of like yep. let's take uh, a physical place. <laughs> And a badass action. And <laughs> yeah. Slap them together. Yeah. It could yeah. be Space Runner next. Yeah, Who yeah, knows? Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Do you have or would you purchase underwear with President Bartlett on it? No. That I would not. That's just disrespectful, right? That's, yeah. It's, it's very unpresidential. Maybe the <laughs> seal of the president. Okay. Possibly. But an actual image. Yeah, no. That's... In your geek uh, life, do you buy clothes with stuff on them? Oh, yeah, is that yeah, a way that you yeah. express yeah, your geekdom? It is, but I've... I mean, I go to... So many cons, and I'm a huge everything fan. Yeah, I shy away from the large, gaudy, just image of that person. Okay, I like things that evoke the, you know, oh, that's a green shirt with a little symbol on it. That's a Green Lantern shirt. I get it. Yeah, rather than here's a giant picture of the Green Lantern. On okay, it. man, you are. Uh, I we are in lockstep on that. Yeah, yeah I yeah. hate the big panorama right. T-shirts, like basically like the Three Moon Wolf thing, but with superheroes. With I superheroes? hate. You're like I yeah. get it. That's what you're into, but it's it's. I think it's so much cooler and also more inclusive. Like as obsessed stuff as nerd stuff, you want it to almost be a little bit of a test. I want someone else on the street to go like, hey, Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, love it, man. Yeah. Because they got what I was doing and not just, here it is. Yeah. Everyone knows what this is. You know? Yeah. I like my Legend of Zelda shirt because people who know Legend of Zelda right. are like, oh, Legend of Zelda and other places. Like, maybe that guy's Celtic. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. It could be anything. Right, <laughs> it right, could right. be anything. Yeah. So, yeah, I really like that it's strong. It's like a secret handshake that yeah. sort of lets people know they're in the same club. Yeah. But it's interesting to me. I, I haven't asked this underwear question in a little while, but it's mm-hmm. interesting to me because people are often like, no, that crosses the line. I like that you were like, I haven't asked this underwear question in a while, but as soon as you walked in the door, <laughs> I was like, i got to ask the underwear question. <laughs> kind of bring it sorry, back into the rotation. Your... No, yeah, please yeah, right, do. Yeah. Please do. Interrupt uh, away. Yeah. But people often uh, have that answer of like, well, sure, certain things. Like, yeah, I'll put Darth Maul on my cock, but... Not President Bartlett. Yeah. That's a bridge too far. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's ingrained into, I mean, that that's the sign of a good character kind of one way or the other. Right. You know, it's sort of like, why did everyone get the Tasmanian devil tattooed on them? <laughs> because he's a nihilist who doesn't give a shit. Yeah. He'd be happy to be part of a tattoo. Yeah. You can't get the granny of, you know, Tweety Bird's granny <laughs> tattooed on you. She's not a person who wants to be right. part, it's of, respectful. part of that. Yeah. 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 Right, and President Bartlett would not be happy yeah. if you're doing a walk and talk in a gym and he saw... Right, right. Sam Seaborn, maybe. He was, he was <laughs> you know, he accidentally slept with a hooker at a time. He was a little more on edge. Okay, so, so he'd be down could, with it. You could maybe do a Sam Seaborn. Okay. Would you see a big-budget movie version of The West Wing made by Michael Bay? No. 
I would not <laughs> Ah, who? This is weird because I kind of unabashedly and unironically love Armageddon. Okay. And like obviously The Rock is a great movie, but everything since then has been such utter dreck. Yeah. That like it's a big and oh loud God, and angry. And just, yeah, the idea I mean, almost any other major feature film director, I would watch a big budget West Wing version by. Yeah. But I can't even wrap my brain around what it, Michael Bay would have the president get kidnapped and then now <laughs> The Secret Service is airlifting in to try and re- rescue him, and yeah. it's just not, it's not the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're you the kind of fan who only wants to see it if it has a chance of being good. You won't just see anything that has what you like slapped on it. You know, as you put me on the spot, I mean, I've probably come, become more discerning as time is Okay. Well. Yeah. In my in my mid-20s, I, I would just, my thing was like, I see every movie in the theater. I see every movie there okay. is. I don't give a shit. And now I'm like... Sure, Teenage Mutant and Mutant Ninja Turtles are great, but that looks like a waste of my time. Yeah, and I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. The older you get, the more your time has value. Yeah. You know? So you're sort of like, I don't want to spend two and a half hours of my time. Now, a Michael Bay version of the Western would be so insanely fucked up <laughs> that I suppose I could get loaded and sort of see it ironically. Yeah. Just to kind of see what the hell he did with this. Yeah. But not if he was in any way trying to make it. Yeah. A cool movie. I know? think that's a great answer that I will not sincerely see this right, movie. Right, right. <laughs> Caveat being, yeah. I will have a wry, I don't give a fuck yeah. look on my face the whole the time. The whole time, yeah. <laughs> My eyes will be rolling in my soul. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the final How Obsessed question. I ask it of everybody. If you couldn't watch The West Wing without you or someone you love first being punched in the crotch, would you still watch The West Wing? Oh, yeah. I would take a punch in the crotch. <laughs> oh, no. I forgot that it could be someone I love. Yeah. Yeah, punch somebody else in the crotch. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, who do I know out there who has a numb crotch already who might be willing to? No, I, yeah. I mean, it's like, honestly, there, there are times, like, I'll go home. I, if I'm having, like, a depressed period of time or something like that, I'll just go home and put it on. And like people that I know will text me and be like, you had a rough day. Probably watching some West Wing, aren't you? Oh, and wow. I'm like, yes, I am. So it would be worth the, the crotch punch. Yeah. For maybe we'll still get that. You know, it's an old friend at this point who you can kind right. of put on in the background. Pay attention to. It's fast enough. You still get new nuance. So yeah, yeah I wouldn't give up watching it for as simple, something as simple as, as some dick pain. Right. And, it, and this would be kind of a noble crotch punch yeah, because yeah, yeah. you're doing what needs to be done right. for the betterment to get me to and much like i mean this show being that this show makes me feel better about things that suck in my life already <laughs> that would be the south be like, west wing my crotch hurts help me yeah and yeah it, it would, would be the cause and the solution exactly. to your problems both, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> existing in both places at once <laughs> nice can you make a noise to sum up your obsession with west wing I ask everybody to make a noise just a noise uh, I mean, uh, one like one single noise. It can't have musicality. To oh it. no, it can have musicality. Oh uh, yeah. So I mean, I mean the opening. Like, you know, I'm not gonna try to sing it. I will make a noise. <laughs> I have a shorthand for it. Instead of calling it the West Wing, I just call it Wang. I guess and I'm watching some Wang. So that would be my noise. Wang. Did that like, develop? How, how was your day, Wang? <laughs> Did that develop because West? Wing was taking too much time to say? It was too long to say. And then I think you also, you know how there's a pronunciation delineation between like, like, hey, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm drinking. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm drinking. Okay. Like that's what really <laughs> shows your your investment in right. the thing. So when I'm really watching it, I'm not watching the West Wing. I'm, I'm wanging. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's great. You want people to know you're getting yeah, down. Absolutely. Yeah, getting yeah. down and doing really, some, re- yep. some deep and Probably dirty wang. not wearing pants. Who knows? <laughs> it's wang time. Leave me alone. Awesome. Uh, so I'm rating people's obsessions. Okay. So the total number is seven, and then I tried to give it a different thing. So I'm going to say seven Bartlets. So right. out of seven Bartlets, mm-hmm. I think you're like four Bartlets obsessed that sounds, with west wing that's okay that sounds about right i would have said yeah you, you four go or five f- so you go all the way to five i mean it's it de- you know it depends the thing that's like obsession is almost uh, uh a pejorative in the term that it implies you know a negative yeah i don't have i don't feel like i have an irrational attachment yeah. to it i don't feel like i uh, relate to it in an unhealthy way or whatever so I don't know if that's where certainly where six and seven territory is starting to get. Yeah, six, yeah. six is when it's like truly deeply right. changing yeah. your day to day. When I'm, it changes your day to day, I'm gonna say four then. Yeah. So I'm yeah, I think uh, I think four. Yeah, seems I think about you, right. You, as the host of the Assess podcast, <laughs> I've done a pretty good job of rating my obsession. <laughs> oh, I'm thrilled. I'm yeah. thrilled. Yeah, because it it does affect you 
on a day to day basis, but it seems like in a really good way. Right. Where you take the best of it. Right. And you use it uh, to solve your wounds, as we were talking about. Yeah. And you you have lines. Yeah. I will not wear Preston yeah, Bartlett yeah, yeah, underwear. Yeah, exactly. Right, I'm right. still healthy. Yeah, that's the line that keeps you under sex right there, for sure. Exactly. Not the, wanting see, like an, an, an aged, yeah, presidential uh, uh, former economics professor on or about your ass area as underwear. That's when you're getting into the mm, sixth yeah, territory. Yeah, like, yeah, I need solid. it on or about my ass yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you're getting into sex. Somewhere within the no-fly area <laughs> of my ass or my crotch. Is President Barton. Is, yeah. uh, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, can you tell people where they can find you on social media? Yeah, so I'm at TJ Chambers LA on virtually everything. Okay. Uh, so there's that. I will, of course, be at San Diego Comic-Con at the end of July. So if anyone's around there. Uh, come say hi and, and watch Sci-Fi Presents live at Comic-Con. And that's what the title, Sci-Fi Presents? Yeah, the whole thing. Sci-Fi Presents live at Comic-Con. Nice. We kind of just wanted to call it live at Comic-Con, but it turns out networks like to have their own name set okay. as part of the title. <laughs> They're really into that. Is there an ellipsis in there? There, for I, dramatic I, we're pause? We're fighting for an, Olympi- an ellipsis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or almost more just for clarity. Because yeah. you, you can't present... Like live is is an adjective that describes the type of thing we're doing. Yeah. So it's kind of weird to say Sci-Fi Presents live. Well, what you're presenting live, that doesn't yeah. really make any sense. And it, so. it's at, so Sci-Fi pre- Presents, uh, it might be Sci-Fi Presents live from Comic-Con. Yeah. I because think that it's, if it was at, it would right, sound right. like live at Comic-Con, oh, yeah, like never go home. Point. I'm sure that discussion was made, <laughs> uh, was had at a higher level than me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, by the way, if any of these Sci-Fi executives are out there, love you. Thank you so much for the paycheck. <laughs> Big fan of the show. Happy to work on it. And I think that Sci-Fi Presents dot, 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 live from Comic-Con is a perfect title. <laughs> Killing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, here are the final questions. They don't have anything to do with the obsession, but they can if you want. If you had to get a tattoo on your forehead, if you, like, had to, what would you get the tattoo of? Just a big, like, rectangular flesh tone, probably, (laughs) with no forehead wrinkles, because I have a super wrinkled forehead. (laughs) So you would find a clever way around. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Or I I already have um, on my inner arm kind of a steampunk-ish tattoo. Okay. That's one of those things where it looks like you opened... And there's gears and sprockets under there. Oh, cool. So I could see doing, if I had to get a forehead tattoo, doing something that sort of looked like it was an open window into the internal mechanization there. Okay. But now I had an old, like, gears and sprockets thing instead of a brain. That okay. would be cool. Yeah, that's so, pretty good. So uh, instead of the flesh tone, cop out, I'll go with that. <laughs> Is that the only clearly. tattoo? Uh, no, I have a bunch. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, have, I, have a, I have a newer Green Lantern symbol. Oh, wow. I have uh, an old, old ship that's the cover of a Decemberist album. I have uh, Star Wars writing in Arbesh, the language from Star Wars. Do you know it what it says? Scoundrel. In scoundrel in Arbesh. The character I always played in Star Wars, the role-playing game, was a Han Solo archetype scoundrel. Um, I have a Latin phrase from a NASA plaque that says, a difficult road leads to the stars. Damn. At Astra Paris Paris. So I got a bunch. Okay. Yeah. So you, would you get Han shot first in Arabesh on your forehead, or is that too far? I think that's too off. Uh, everyone knows. It's like, I know what you're doing. Yeah. We know. Like, that's, <laughs> to me, even still needing to say Han shot first yeah. is pretending like it's still a debate worth having. It is not. It has been put to bed. Yep. Han clearly shot first. I don't need a t-shirt or a tattoo or anything saying It is sort of like saying Hitler was wrong. Like, yeah, we got yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. We got it. Very good analogy. <laughs> yep. Greedo equals Hitler. Greedo is more Goebbels in this point, I guess. We would yeah. Say. The right-hand man of the time. Okay. If you were a sandwich, what kind of sandwich would you be? Oh, man. I would be... I have a weird... I'm a cold roast beef uh, with some American cheese and a little bit of ketchup. Okay, why? It's a weird thing on that. Why cold? I like I'm, I'm like a I'm like a cold roast beef like okay. like a deli meat like a yeah. sliced like okay. it's just more I mean ninety five percent of the sandwiches I eat I prefer a hot sandwich okay but it's something refreshing about that nice like yeah. cold roast beef sandwich but you're the sandwich yes so I'm the sandwich so in the so way are that, you cold that, that is I think that I am refreshing okay um, no I think that I I uh, I'm, I'm I last for a long time yeah so that it can be stored away and don't go bad very yeah. easily really what more it is is Probably my relation to that is like, it's pretty, like lunch meats are pretty versatile. Yeah. You can throw them on anything and they'll, they'll kind of fit in and work pretty well. Yeah. And that's a thing that I think has served me well in life and in my professional career. Is right. That like, th- I've been thrown into a lot of different weird circumstances and I feel like I still matched those circumstances well. Right. So something like a nice, simple, n- nice sliced roast beef goes everywhere. Everyone's happy to have it. Right. 
that is a great sandwich that you can work with. That almost anybody can say, like, maybe I have a problem with this part of the sandwich, but I can work right. with it, and yeah. I'll still have some sandwich yeah, left. Yeah, yeah, there's still going to be something that's going to work for me. Yeah, it's a good point. The roast you beef can... is cold. It's not, like, all melted in the bun, so if right. you're... Right, you're... yep, it's easily... It could be easily be removed and made into its own different separate thing. <laughs> it's Yeah, it doesn't have to be ingrained in the rest of the yeah. thing. Yeah, if you're a Philly cheesesteak, there's no way to separate those parts. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. And clearly, the uh, I, I love your tattoos, the eclectic nature of interests. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm all over the place. Yeah. Right. It's great in a good way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the final question for everyone on the podcast is what is happiness? I think that happiness is it's keeping the, the proper range of view on your life. It's thinking okay. ahead, but not so far ahead that you become a mountain of worry about ever getting there. Yeah. And not so short in the future that you're just flying by the seat of your pants. OK. I, I like to have a long enough view on things that like. You know, someone cutting me off in traffic doesn't affect me because th- my that that's a very short term view to have on things. Am I going to remember that instance in a week, in a month, in a year? Yeah, absolutely not. So I think happiness is having that proper perspective of future distance. Whereas, you know, is this bad thing that happened to me going to stick with me forever? No. Okay. Is this good thing that happened to me going to stick with me forever? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. It's a temporary feeling that I will enjoy. But not yeah. try to squeeze every last bit of and move on, you know. Yeah, that's shockingly healthy. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I mean that's great. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure it will serve you well. It's a really, really great answer. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed. I mean, <laughs> come back to me in a year when you're like obsessed rehab edition or whatever. You know? <laughs> Let's find out what's gone wrong with all of our guests. <laughs> that is a great yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. Check in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll have and to I'm go like, to you. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, good thing I was really pro needle exchange. That's turned out to be very important in my life. I'm now in TJ's home. Needles yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, right. wanging. He's wanging. He yeah. won't stop wanging. He doesn't. He doesn't even have. Still, he sold his DVD player for drugs. He's just spinning the DVD on his <laughs> finger and reciting lines from The West Wing. He thinks he, he has a laser installed in his <laughs> eye, so he's accessing that's, the. Yeah. That's just a red Sharpie that he's drawing at the bottom with, not a laser. Okay. Uh, well, don't worry about it, because it's too far in the future, yeah, so you don't have to worry future. about yeah, it. That's not the proper perspective to have, man. That's yeah. unhappiness, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Fun. That is our podcast. All right. You've been listening to Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest shared some stories with the rest. Rate five stars if you're impressed. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Great day in the morning. Victory is mine. Bring me the finest muffins and bagels in the land and lay them before me.